In Japanese semiconductor lore, the VLSI project holds a special place. Many people, both in and outside of Japan, point to it as the key development to pave the way towards Japanese dominance of the world's semiconductor industry. But how did the VLSI project actually work, and how did it actually help the industry to leapfrog the Americans? In this video, we revisit the VLSI project and the strengthening of the Japanese semiconductor industry. It all started because of a rumor about IBM. IBM had long been in the Japanese computer industry, winning business there despite many market and cultural challenges. Powerful products like the System 370, a successor to the 360 and first introduced in 1970, were especially popular and gained market share. That year, 1970, domestic Japanese computer firms had 60% of their own market. Four years later, that had fallen to 48%. IBM was catching up with 30%. IBM was far larger than any of the big Japanese computer makers. In 1974, IBM generated 4 trillion yen in revenue and spent 300 billion yen in R&D. Globally, Big Blue had 62% of the world market in computers. By contrast, Japan's largest local computer market, Fujitsu, only produced 240 billion yen in revenue and spent only 25 billion yen in R&D. Globally, their market share was just 3%. IBM's gains from 1970 to 1974 came amidst further pressure on the Japanese from the U.S. government to liberalize their computer market. The prospect of Japan's local firms totally losing their own market to IBM struck fear into the heart of Japanese politicians and its Ministry of International Trade and Industry, or MITI. In 1975, a significant rumor swept through Japan. A Fujitsu employee received several IBM documents released in a court case. In it, IBM detailed a plan they had secretly initiated in 1971 called the Future Systems, or FS Plan. The plan was to replace the System 370 with a line of revolutionary new systems based on cutting-edge technologies. One of the targets was a 1 megabit memory chip to be released in 1980. Unbeknownst to the Japanese, IBM had already killed off the FS project that year, likely due to issues with program incompatibility and generating the necessary technology breakthroughs. Some of its ideas eventually did make it to the market, though, as the System 38. Nevertheless, the rumor spurred the government into action. IBM had coined this classification for its systems. The first generation is a vacuum tube second generation, a transistor, and the third generation, an integrated circuit. A generation 3.5 system like the System 360 is an LSI, or Large Scale Integrated System. So the next step beyond that, the fourth generation, would be very large scale integrated systems. The chips in such systems were defined as having over 100,000 devices on it. So things starting with the 64K DRAM generation. Japan had to have a VLSI system of its own for the market. The politician's first instinctual response had been to merge the five or six existing Japanese computer companies, thinking that IBM's heft can only be matched by a company of equal size. But the companies themselves resisted this. They had already gone through a round of forced partnerships in the late 1960s, paired into three groups of two like as if they were in elementary school and with little results. Instead, in April 1974, the Japan Electronic Industry Development Association proposed a cooperative R&D project for VLSI development. Many histories talk about the VLSI project like as if the idea fell out of the sky, a lightning strike of inspiration. The reality is that Japan had been doing R&D consortiums for a long time with good success. The VLSI project was set up as an Engineering Research Association or ERA structure which the Japanese have used for nearly two decades. They lifted it from the United Kingdom. The British government had long used research associations, or RAs, to financially support and promote collaboration between competitors in an industry. Traditionally, these British research associations did not last very long. The maximum was about 11.5 years and involved about five to nine small and medium-sized businesses rather than large conglomerates. After World War II ended, the director of MIDI's mechanical engineering lab, Dr. Masao Sugimoto, 
observed a few of these RAs and decided to employ a similar model to help rebuild Japan's mechanical industry. Due to the war, the American occupation had disassembled the major conglomerates, the Zaibatsu, so most companies in Japan were small and medium-sized businesses. The RA seemed like an ideal tool to upskill these companies. Dr. Sugimoto first tried this tactic with five to six Japanese radiator companies in 1955. It was a success and led to many more of these ERAs to be established during the 1960s in areas as diverse as camera lenses, pistons, bearings, polymers, and camshaft bearings. These ERAs had a number of common features. MIDI would issue a formal tender, 10 to 12 companies would be assigned to it with one as the project lead. The ERA would be established as a formal legal entity and sign a contract with MIDI. After completing the contract, it dissolves, just like a Mr. Meeseeks. So the structure had been around, but it did recede for a while until after the energy crises of the 1970s. When MIDI decided to use it for VLSI systems, it was the first time such a thing had been used for the industry. The VLSI projects, timelines, and deadlines were set according to rumor. If IBM's rumored 1 megabit chip was planned for 1980, then the Japanese needed something of their own to be ready by 1979. Moving from existing LSI systems to VLSI class systems would require new equipment upgrades and operation paradigms across the entire manufacturing line. The five participants were Fujitsu, Hitachi, Mitsubishi Electric, NEC, and Toshiba. They were fierce competitors, Toshiba, NEC, and Hitachi in particular, and they continued to battle each other outside of the project. Many determined that the best way to get these competitors to work together was to focus on problems upstream from their own products. The phrase continually used by MIDI roughly translates to basic and common. The work of actually making the computers would be left to the members themselves. Two themes of this type of basic and common research were chosen, microfabrication and silicon wafers. I want to note that the United States Semitech initiatives when selecting their own areas of research also went upstream in the same way a few years later, targeting the semiconductor equipment makers. So from the outset, the project's goal was to make VLSI class computers, not necessarily chips. The computer angle explains why several companies were excluded from the project, even those known for being good semiconductor makers like Oki or Sony. In March 1976, the VLSI project was announced to the public for the first time, and things were underway. The VLSI project was budgeted to last for four years. Half of its total $288 million budget was contributed by the consortium's participants. The other half would be funded by the government in the form of interest-free and repayable whenever loans. The project was led by a board of directors staffed by each of the five member companies' presidents. Its managing director was Masato Nabashi, a grandfatherly MIDI executive who soothed egos, drank a lot with the individual participants, and kept things rolling. Ironically enough, he went to go work for IBM Japan a little bit after finishing his time at the project before returning and retiring. 80% of the VLSI project funding went to companies for performing research within their own laboratories, with the majority of the knowledge flowing only to them. The remainder was for cooperative efforts, where the competitors had to work together and all shared in the gains. This included a full joint or cooperative lab with staff chosen from all five companies working together in the wing of an NEC building. This lab was run by Yasuo Tarui, who is still alive as of this writing and now 94 years old. In addition to the full cooperative lab, we also had two group labs with NEC and Toshiba working together in the first group lab and the other three project participants in the other. During the project's development, several people in the Japanese government, notably a budget examiner in the Ministry of Finance named Nakahira, cautioned that its subsidies will trigger tensions with the United States. Their worries were well-founded. In May 1977, shortly after the project began, one of the laboratories published the results of their work, a variable-shaped beam device for lithography. This announcement was not published in a dry academic forum, but rather in a public Japanese newspaper, probably because the lab wanted the public to know what they were doing with government money, but the widespread coverage quickly made its way to the United States. 
Before long, American semiconductor leaders like Wilf Corrigan of Fairchild and Charles Spork of National Semiconductor were calling the VLSI project and its government subsidies anti-competitive. The question kept coming up again and again, what is Japan's VLSI project doing? People working in the project wanted to dispel these misunderstandings and falsehoods, but secrecy requirements did not allow it. Notably, on December 5, 1977, the cooperative lab director, Tarui, was asked to give a speech in Washington, D.C. for the organization IEEE. Tarui saw an opportunity to clarify what was really going on in the project. He asked for permission to broadly explain what the group labs were working on. He also asked for permission to clarify the budget and put it into context, especially that just 10-20% to of the project budget would be spent on its most controversial part, the supposedly anti-competitive cooperative work. But for reasons unknown, Managing Director Nabashi did not grant this permission. So unfortunately, Tarui could only give the vaguest of descriptions to the 600 people in the audience, which included semiconductor professionals and politicians. It was a missed opportunity in U.S.-Japanese relations. So what were the VLSI project's three group labs actually working on? The joint lab led by Tarui handled the most significant topics for the project. This included lithography, with six prototype tools produced using ultraviolet light, x-rays, and electron beams. The ultraviolet light tools were photolithography tools, using optical systems and light to shrink and project a design onto a wafer. Such technologies were the most commonly used of the era. However, the 1 megabit memories that IBM was thought to use for its FS project would require IC feature sizes below 1 micrometer. The Japanese believe that photolithography cannot achieve sub-micrometer feature sizes because the wavelengths can't get any smaller. So the project especially focused their efforts on the two technologies they saw as photolithography's heirs, X-ray lithography and electron beam lithography. One prototype tool was what we now call a proximity X-ray lithography machine. It's a shadow printing technique using high energy X-rays. There is no size reduction, so you have to make the mask at the same size of the final product. The lab eventually found it impractical. It was too hard aligning the mask to the wafer. Thus, electron beam lithography was seen as the single most promising next generation lithography, and the team explored two directions. The first was a variation of what we now call electron beam projection lithography. You fire an electron beam onto a mask that shrinks the mask's features to a fourth of its size. As a result, it can print at a resolution of 0.2 micrometers. The second idea was different and quite innovative, the photocathode. You fire light onto a layer of cesium iodide, which emits electrons that can be focused towards the wafer using a magnetic field. Confusingly enough, in addition to all this electron beam lithography work, the project also worked on electron beam direct lithography. This is where we manipulate the beam like as if it were a pencil or a finger of God to directly draw a design onto a substrate. These devices were eventually transferred to Toshiba Machining, later named New Flare Technology, to sell machines to write photo masks. Despite the majority of the lab's effort focused elsewhere, work was still done on photolithography. In the end, photolithography was not yet ready to cede the throne. Such efforts established Nikon and Canon's dominance in photolithography. The lab had commissioned three exposure tools from the two companies. Two of them used traditional ultraviolet light, the 436 nanometer G line, to print wafers. The machines were called the VLSR1 and the VLSR2. A third, MR1, would use a tighter wavelength classified as deep ultraviolet or DUV. This MR1 DUV machine used mirrors for optics, similar to the UV lithography machine years later. Canon later sold the MR1 as a tool for producing LCD panels, a smaller market. Canon made the VLSR1. The SR1 was a proximity aligner with a 1 to 1 size mask. This meant that the mask's features needed to be as small as the chip itself, which was a lot of work. It can also only print feature sizes of 2 micrometers. Smaller feature print sizes and a mask that is harder to make are big downsides. The upside though is that you can print a larger area of the wafer than the SR2, a 30 by 30 millimeter plot versus just 10 by 10. 
Nikon made the VLSR2. The VLSR2 uses optics to shrink the chip design by 10 times to reach feature sizes of 1 micrometer, half the size of the SR1 and meeting the threshold for VLSI. The VLSR2 is a step and repeat tool, or stepper. You basically move the mask across the wafer, flashing as you go. This requires extremely precise mechanics to position the wafer with micrometer accuracy to prevent one wafer exposure from interfering with the others. In other words, good overlay. To do this, the VLSR2 implemented an innovative laser position alignment system that another Japanese governmental entity, the Electric Research Institute, patented 10 years earlier. This laser alignment system allows you to measure exactly where the wafer is and position it, allowing Nikon to reduce overlay errors to unprecedented levels. Working with the VLSI project people on VLSR1 and VLSR2 allowed Nikon and Canon to realize that they had something good. Nikon quickly commercialized their VLSR2 prototype, releasing it in 1980 as the NSR1010G stepper. Meanwhile, the new learnings from the project allowed Canon to improve their PLA series of proximity aligner tools and win the market. Then in 1984, Canon joined Nikon in the stepper space when they released their FPA 1500. Later on, Tarui regarded the development of electron beam lithography along with the perfection of the stepper mechanism using laser alignment to be the VLSI project's crowning achievements. The second major area of technology development was in silicon crystal. This involved mostly wafers, but also other things incidental to it. With regards to wafers, the VLSI project commissioned prototypes of larger diameter 5-inch wafers from existing Japanese wafer makers. They inspected those prototypes for warpage and defects, working with the manufacturers to improve them. A large group also worked on epitaxial growth using beams to create very pure and well-structured layers of silicon on top of the existing wafer surface. The silicon wafer work done was world-class, and the Japanese became one of the best at it. One of those manufacturers, Shinetsu, another non-member of the VLSI project, is now the world's biggest silicon wafer maker. The final three items, dry etch, diagnosing, and design structures, were handled by the two smaller group labs. I don't think they were significant, so let me just briefly go through them. Dry etch refers to a broad category of manufacturing steps wherein you engrave the chip design onto the wafers after lithography. Dry etch is a newly developed variant of the etch that does not use chemical-based wet baths. Diagnosing, which I presume to be a reference to the category of mask inspection tools and similar tools for inspecting the wafer as it goes through production. And the last section involved basic transistor design structures and CAD software. This seemed to have involved the work of developing better simulation technologies for advanced chip design. The VLSI project did not produce a single commercialized product, yet it upgraded Japan's semiconductor equipment industry, it helped strengthen Japan's two weaker computer makers, NEC and Mitsubishi, and it helped launch Japan towards building more chips. In 1980, the Japanese conglomerates invested a cumulative $1 billion into new plants and capital for 64K memory. By 1982, the Japanese had a staggering 70% market share in 64K memory, the first of what we call VLSI systems. Such advanced memories could not have been produced so cheaply and at such volume without the procedures studied in the project, particularly lithography. The next year, they unveiled the next generation memory, 256K DRAM and started to put that into high volume production. This subsequent Japanese surge was widely perceived in the United States to have been caused by the VLSI project. A panel in the US House of Representatives concluded in a 1983 report that coordinated research, partially underwritten by the Japanese government, has given Japanese companies a major share of the world market in 64K RAM microchips. As a result, the U.S. government and industry closely studied the Japanese VLSI project and emulated it, amending their antitrust laws with the National Cooperative Research Act of 1984 in doing so. One year later, in 1985, Fujitsu announced that they had achieved AGI, oh wait, sorry, the one megabit memory chip. Rumor had now become reality. As mentioned, the vast majority of the consortium's total funds, 80 to 90%, was spent the normal way. 
Nevertheless, it was the first time a semiconductor R&D project had a cooperative portion, and that is a legit breakthrough in the semiconductor industry, one copied in subsequent years by the United States and others. But making it work was challenging. Learnings that worked for, say, NEC would not have worked for Fujitsu, especially when you start to move them towards high-volume production. NEC Executive Vice President Michiyuki Wenohara said, Even in Japan, cooperation among competing companies is almost impossible as technical development moves closer to product levels. This is not only due to business competition, but also due to the differences in fine details of process technology which has been accumulated for many years and integrated into the individual company's major automation systems. Considering this and the vast logistical challenges of getting competitors to work together, it is fair to somewhat downplay the cooperative element. We should also not discount the VLSI project's excellent timing, especially in the ultra-important lithography technology space. It was the exact right thing at the exact right time. Nevertheless, the work done in this way had major lasting effects on the Japanese and global microelectronics industry. It was downright legendary. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, and I uh, guess I'll see you guys next time.